Good morning. So, um, if we just got a few little stage movements here, <laughs> you'll understand why in a few minutes, not just yet. Um, I'm going to start with a little verse that's well known from John's Gospel. John chapter 13, verse 35. 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, love one another, as I have loved you. Well, that's pretty hard, isn't it? We've just, Dave has just been, you know, explaining the depths of what has been done for us. I'm going to say it again. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By, all, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But you know what happens when <laughs> things annoy us? When uh, we can see doing something, someone doing something that we think they really shouldn't be doing? Uh, there's lots of things that can cause that love to be obscured so that we it's not easy to see and sometimes that love can even be reduced down and uh, well you know it can get worse there's uh, a lot of verses that give point to one particular reason for love being broken or interfered with but of course there's lots and lots of other reasons but I'm going to just read one, and it is, do not slander. You know, it's actually one of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments, do not give false witness against anyone. Uh, it's repeated, that was in Exodus, it's repeated in uh, and Deuteronomy, it's repeated in Leviticus, and it's repeated by Peter in the New Testament. And if you look it up in a concordance or something, you'll find it's just everywhere. <laughs> It's all over the Bible. Slander is a big thing. And uh, I'm not sure how often we talk about it because we don't like it. None of us like it. Um, James talks about one of the problems that we have and that is to do with our tongues. So I'm just going to read a little bit from James chapter 3. He's talking about, you know, putting bits into the mouth of horses or, you know, rudders on ships. And, you know, this little thing that you put into the mouth of a horse or the little thing you put on the back of a ship uh, has a lot of power. So he says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. In other words, you know, it's got an awful lot of uh, power and effect as it, as it goes, talks. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue's also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body can also, of course, be good, as we all know. It corrupts a whole person, sets a whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Not a very nice description and when, you know, sometimes when I've read that I thought, oh, maybe I'd just be better off without my tongue. You know, God, do you want to rip it out? <laughs> because, you know, it's such a dangerous thing and I'm speaking to myself as I will, as I'm speaking to everyone. We all know that the tongue and, uh, you know, it, it also says that in scripture can be a place of blessing and also it can be used in the wrong way and it can end up pulling people down. Now there's an extended example in the Old Testament of believers who are friends and they end up using their tongues not quite in the best way. And there's a whole story taken from the book of Job and you probably know bits of the story. 
it's a whole 42 chapters long so you know it's it's quite tough to wade through but I'm going to set the scene and then Stuart and I are going to do a little play so that's what all this moving around is um, so I'm going to read from the beginning of the book of Job just to set the scene you probably know it but I'm still going to read bits of the beginning in the land of Uz we don't really know where that was there lived a man whose name was Job this man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys. Now those numbers are probably not very important to us but it basically says he's rich, right? Because your money was how many animals you had and what sort. And he had a large number of servants. So 10 kids, lots of servants, and he was a rich and powerful man. He was in fact the greatest man among all the people of the East. And it says a bit about his family. Then he says, well, then there's a little scene in the heavenly realm. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. And this is the mysterious realm. We don't really understand this scene completely. And actually, we're not meant to. But the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan said, oh, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. What does Satan say? Does God fear Job for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands. His flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to his face, to your face. The Lord said to Satan, well, very well then. Everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The next bit of the story, we have these messengers coming to Job suddenly. And the first one says, well, you know, there, was, um, there, was a, there were raiding people and um, what happened was your oxen and your donkeys they were attacked and they were killed and what's more the servants that were looking after them were killed too but i was the only one that was left in the escape to come and tell you what all my oxen or my donkeys well, that's work animals i mean that's huge that's a big loss that's like losing your tractors and like losing you know everything that you need to do your farming and then while he was kind of recovering from that Another messenger came and he said, well, fire of God fell from the sky and then the sheep, they were burnt, all of them killed. And the servants that were involved with the sheep, they died too. There's just one person left and it's me. You start to hear him think, well, what on earth is going on? This is a tragedy to lose all those 7,000 sheep as well as my oxen and donkeys. And then while he's speaking, another one says, you know, these raiding people, they came and they took away your camels. Camels in a dry land, that's a big, huge loss. And what's more, they killed your servants and I'm the only one left. Then there was a fourth messenger. See, by now he's lost all of his animals, all of his wealth, all of his means of working, all of his means of income, it's all gone. Another one came and said, you know, Job, your sons and daughters were having a feast last night. He knew that. But while they were there, this sudden mighty wind came and it struck the house that they were in and all of them died. I'm the only one who's escaped. To tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robes and shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away and may the name of the Lord be praised. He did not sin in any of this. 
it's not the end of the story because there's another little scene in the heavenly places when you know the lord and satan are having this conversation and satan said well you know he hasn't sinned so far but i reckon if you really actually attack his body then he will definitely curse you to your face god said well you can try it and see see what he's made of and then job himself develops these sores all over his body we're not told exactly what they are they probably had different names for it then anyway but something that's pretty irritating and it's pretty painful and can you imagine the grief of this man who has lost everything including his the health of his own skin and then to make matters worse his wife comes along and says are you still holding on to your, your integrity curse god and die i reckon that would have been the hardest one he replied you're talking like a foolish woman shall we accept good things from god and not trouble in all this job did not sin in what he said job had three good friends eliphaz and uh, Eliphaz is going to be in our play and Bildad and Zophar and they came along probably on their camels and they came to see him they heard about his great tragedy that was great that his friends came then they sat with him for seven days in silence and that was the best thing they did and the story starts to deteriorate after that when we were in Ethiopia, one of our um, students um, had a death in his family. His brother suddenly died. And, um, and so we went along to the house with other people from the college. What did we do? For seven days, we didn't stay there all seven days. We went for a few hours, but people took it in turns. And we sat in silence. Nobody said anything. Seven days. That custom still applies. We have a daughter-in-law from Thailand. They do the same thing still today. So that all makes sense. And I remember going through this story with students in Ethiopia. They could understand it, I think, a lot more easily than what we can. And then after the seven days of sitting in silence, Job broke the silence. Now... When Stuart and I put our hats on, we're in character. Stuart is Job. I am Eliphaz, one of the friends. May the day of my birth perish and the night when they announced a boy is born. Why did I not die at birth as I came out from my mother's womb? Job, just think of how, many, how you've taught so many people and how your encouraging words have made other people strong. But now when you experience trouble, you're discouraged. You should not be like this. From what I've seen, trouble only comes to those who've done wrong surely someone in despair should have some help from his friends these friends are more like streams that dry up you can't count on them they see something they don't like and they get scared they end up making things worse At the end of scene one. It actually comes from the Bible. <laughs> I've just paraphrased it a bit to uh, shorten it and make it easier. I wonder how we'd feel if somebody who we knew, who was a good Christian, started saying stuff like that. I wish I'd never been born. This is too terrible for me to cope with. I think I should die. 
Have you ever been there when somebody's said that? When somebody you know has been someone who's been upright, somebody who's been uh, faithful, somebody who's been godly, somebody who's been a leader, somebody who's encouraged a lot of other people. You know, it's really easy to turn around and tell them what they shouldn't be doing. But I wonder how we'd be if we just lost all of our children, our job, our livelihood, everything we owned, and now our health. It's all gone. People say a lot of things when they're in grief, great grief. This is huge grief. This is immense grief. And sometimes we're not known by our love when we're very quick to judge them and saying, you should be like this, you should be like this, you should be saying this, you should be still saying the right and kind encouraging words that you said before. It's not a time for shoulds. It's not a time for saying what's right and wrong about what they're saying at the moment. When people are in grief, huge grief, what they need is our friendship. That's what Job needed. He just needed some kindness. He just needed them to stay there. You know, they'd sat with him in silence for seven days, but as soon as he actually said what he felt, they got scared, they couldn't cope. And then Eliphaz started implying that the cause of all this was that he was wrong, that he was a sinner, that he'd actually done something that was bad. He had no proof, of course, but he's raised that as, you know, saying, well, this is what I know about God and you. You've got to remember these three friends, and represented by Eliphaz, they are the equivalent of, let's say, elders. <laughs> they're not people who don't know anything about God. And they're not people who don't know anything about Job. It's a bit scary. Now we're going to go to scene two. <coughs> My friends just ridicule me and write me off. But I've called on God and he answered me. I don't understand. But I know that I did not cause all this trouble by my sin. <coughs> Job, your own words condemn you there. What do you know that we don't know? Let me tell you what I know. The one who suffers torment is a wicked man because he shakes his fists at God and he won't escape the darkness. My face is red from crying. Deep shadows are around my eyes. Yet I know that my hands have been free from violence, and I know that my prayer is pure. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My eyes pour out my tears to God, and one day I will see him. It's interesting here because Job says quite a lot that he's praying. He's actually going to God, saying, God, what's going on? I don't understand. But there's no sign in the whole book that the friends are praying. The friends think they know everything about God and how he works in the heavenly places and in the earthly places. They think they've got God sewn up. But actually, they're not facing God. You know, what do you do if you get, you know, a situation like this and, you know, somebody who's been living an honest and upright life, um, you know, really a believer and doing everything that you can think of that's right and something like this happens. We ask questions. And one of the things the friends could have done 
I just clung to God and said, God, what's going on? You know, I know my friend Job. I know what he's like. I know that he's not, you know, a bad person. And, uh, you know, I can't think of anything obvious. Job wasn't perfect. He was like us. But they didn't do that. They didn't even ask Job, Job, can you think of any reason that you know about? He would have said no. He was going through in his mind over and over and over again, God, what have I done? God, you can, you can tell me, you can speak to me, you can, you, know, you can tell me if I need to put something right. He was doing that. And the friends were not. They didn't even stop to think that they might be wrong. And so the only place Job can go is to God. That's the only place. We've been singing, I was just singing some of the worship songs we had this morning just really took me in my own mind that really the only place where we can get the truth, where we can get, the, you know, other, where God knows everything is in that place with God. That is the only place. And sometimes even our good friends can misjudge us. They may not need to. And I don't even think that these three friends meant to do anything wrong. I think they were trying to help. I think they really wanted Job to repent so that he could get healed. Their aim was good. It's just that they didn't get it right in their understanding of Job. Let's go to scene three. How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Ten times now you have reproached me, shamelessly you have attacked me. If it's true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? You gave no water to the weary, and you withheld food from the hungry. Though you were a powerful man, you sent widows away empty-handed. You did not help the fatherless. That is why all these snares are around you, why it is so dark that you cannot see. I have examined myself. If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the widows grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothes, or if I did not give him warmth from a fleece of my sheep, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. For fear of God, I could not do such things. There are only three scenes in this. We've done them. But how did God view all of this? Did God hate anyone here? You know, Job had been calling out directly to God. The three friends had not called out to God at all because they knew. Why would they need to ask God anything? They knew. They knew all about God in the heavenly places and in the earthly places and everywhere else. They knew everything there was to know at that time about God. After these scenes, and we've shortened them of course, then there's two other people who speak. One's a man, Elihu, who just he looks to see what's going on and then he gives his opinion and it's really not much different from the friend's. Then the second person speaks, and it is the Lord himself. Who does he speak to? Job. Why would he speak to the friends? They hadn't spoken to him. 
So he comes and he speaks to Job. And he basically says to Job, look up. Who's the creator? Who's made all of the animals? Who's made the clouds and the sea and everything else that's in them? And what he did not in the few, verse five for four chapters, it's looked very long. Never once did the Lord tell Job, did, did the Lord name any sin that Job had committed, nor did he ever say that there was any sin that Job had committed. What he did was ask, invited Job to worship. That's what we do when we don't know what's going on. Invited Job to worship. Look up. You know, if you're in trouble, we all get into trouble at different times. Look up. Look at the one who made you. Look at the one who made all of the vast universe because he's big enough to know what's going on right now, even if you don't and the doctors don't and everybody else doesn't. Look up and trust him. He's big enough to deal with this. And then Job answers to the Lord. And it's an answer of humility. An answer of humility. There's no confession of a particular sin because he doesn't know a particular sin. It's not, he's not saying, I'm perfect and I've never sinned. But you know, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, it's particular. It's specific. It's not just... Oh, I'm a terrible, terrible sinner. This is what I'm guilty of, God, and I want to put it right. Lord, please forgive me for this particular sin. That's helpful. That's conviction of sin. Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament times too. I taught a course on that last year. And after this big conversation between the Lord and Job, and Job had come to a position of rest. And it's really through this humility. He doesn't have to argue with God. Because God knows. He's arguing with his friends, but he doesn't have to argue with God. After all of this, the Lord did speak to Eliphaz. And what did he say? I am angry with you and your friends. And I think that's what Eliphaz actually wanted to hear. Because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer. Now that's a bit of an about turn, isn't it? And these friends who had been going on for 40 chapters about how right they were and how wrong Job was, suddenly had to be doing about turn and they had to bring seven bulls and seven rams. Now that mustn't mean much to us, but a normal sacrifice for a normal sin, that could be a pretty big sin, was one sheep. And if you were poor, you could get away with two pigeons or you could get away with some other grains for certain kinds of problems. But to sacrifice a bull, a whole bull, like that's huge. You've got to be pretty rich to sacrifice a bull. And this says seven bulls and seven rams. That's unheard of. That's huge. This is God saying this is a huge sin and it's a sin that's big enough to affect the whole community. That's what seven bulls and seven rams means. What you've done, Eliphaz and your friends, 
is inflict basically through slander, even though that word's not used there, it's used everywhere else. You've inflicted an injury on not only one person, but on the community. That's what that sacrifice means. And you've got to go to Job, the person that you've been telling was wrong, and he has to pray for you. Wonder how Job felt about that? Because, you know, if Job prayed for them, he knew what was God was like. We've been celebrating it here this morning. God will bring forgiveness. That's what God's like. And reconciliation. And God will put things right between Job and his friends. Job and God and his friends and God. The whole lot. All of it. I loved it when uh, Dave said, you know, the arithmetic is good. <laughs> God's arithmetic is good, you know, like there's nothing left out. That's what God wanted. He wanted the whole situation fixed, covered. But the people who had spoken wrongly, even if their motives were right, had to take their step of doing this great, big, huge, monstrous sacrifice and Job had to do his step of being willing to pray, which means willing to forgive. They did it. Eliphaz and his friends got their sacrifices. They did it, which is an act of humility, isn't it? Job prayed for his friends. And after that, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. And the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. It goes on to say he had double the number of oxen, donkeys, camels and sheep. And then he got the same number of children again, seven sons and three daughters and lived a long time. I thought about the story of Elijah. You know, Elijah was a really courageous, amazing prophet of God. And uh, you remember up on the mountain, Mount Carmel, and they had the, the uh, altars and the sacrifices and the other prophets of Baal were dancing around and calling on their gods for the fire to you know, work. And of course it didn't. Elijah got up there and put all the buckets of water around and he simply prayed and the fire came. Despite the water, it's consumed everything there. It was an amazing show of God's presence and God's power and that he actually cared for his people. But of course the nasty Queen Jezebel was after Elijah and he ran away quickly he ran and ran and ran and ran until he was exhausted and he lay down and then he said to God, you know, take my life, I want to die. Sounds a bit like Job. And uh, there was no one around, there were no friends around to put, point the finger at him and say, you've just been this amazing prophet of God, what are you doing talking like that? You know, that's rubbish. Nobody around to say that except perhaps a servant or two. But God looks at him. You know what? Remember what God does? Does he condemn Elijah for that outburst? No. He simply thinks, okay, what well, this guy needs is food and sleep. Practical. God's quite practical. <laughs> so he, he gets some, um, you know, he gets some meat, we are animals. Uh, and brings them to Elijah and he says, okay, have some food. You need some strength. Gets him to have a rest. He lays down and a, has a wonderful sleep. He has a bit more food and so forth. And then he's got his energy back and then God gives him his next instruction of where he's to go. Not running away, but going to the place that God wants him to go to. 
You see, if friends like Job's friends had been around at that time, they could have pointed the finger and they could have shot him down. But all of us get exhausted, don't we? I do. And sometimes when you've just been experiencing some amazing, you know, exp amazing experience of God, um, and you've seen God do all kinds of stuff and you've been involved in ministry and everything, after a time, you simply need rest and food. Basic stuff. We are not unlimited. And, uh, you know, this comes back to the verse that Jesus said. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. You know, those friends of Job, who really didn't turn out to be very faithful friends, but those friends were not judged on what they knew that God was doing in the heavenly places because actually they're not supposed to. We get glimpses every now and again. Every now and again God gives a bit of discernment here and there and, you know, involved in direct ministry. I know that happens. I've experienced that myself. But basically we're little people. And we only get glimpses and... Some of our glimpses are not right because we're not, they're not the full story. And so Job's friends were not judged on how well their doctrine lined up with what God you know, believed or taught. They were not judged on how well they could uh, teach Job about the doctrines of God. They were judged on how well they cared for their friend, the person in front of them. The human stuff. You know, we can get caught up here and forget about here. This is where we are called to relate to people. Human level. People, person to person. Weak person to weak person. And sometimes we're called to pray specific other things, but they need to be usually in particular contexts. Jesus went on to say, by this love, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, that's the test. Can I just pray? Father God, we confess to you that we are not all knowing like you are. We confess that every single one of us in this room sometimes gets things wrong or partly wrong or a bit confused or a bit twisted even if we want to get it right. Father, we confess that you alone are the all-knowing one. And Father God, the, the test that you set or that you allowed in the book of Job um, and then it was really a test not really just of Job but the test was more importantly of his friends and Father God we thank you that your way of forgiveness and reconciliation was made and of course we know that that can not only continues but we see it more clearly in what Jesus has done for us our Father God Give us eyes of grace towards one another. Give us care over our tongues in what we say to one another and about one another. 
And Father, give us that self-discipline that is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we may not accidentally put people through greater grief and greater shame and greater agony than what they're already going through. Please help them, us to lift them up rather than put them down. And we, Father God, we just pray for your help and your wisdom in this for all of us, all of us, in Jesus' name. Amen.